Welcome to another episode, the 23 part collection where we are doing 23 Michael Jordan videos in 23 days. Today, we are looking at the story on The Shot. Now you probably know The Shot, but do you know everything that happened on this day with all the players recounting a story and their version on what happened on this day? Craig Elo retells his version, Jordan retells his version, as well as all the other NBA players involved on this day. Here's the video, and I hope you guys enjoy. The one thing that I'll ask, if you do enjoy these videos, it takes a long time to edit them, so I'd really appreciate it if you guys could hit that like button. Let's aim for 5,000 likes for the next episode. Subscribe if you are new for more MJ videos coming out to you in December, and hit that notification button so you are notified as soon as the video releases. All the footage and video links that are used in this video are also featured on the screen right now and in the description box down below, so be sure to check them out. And I hope you guys enjoy the video. One of the stories you chronicle in the book is Craig Elo. Mm -hmm. We all know the shot. They talked about the shot. Well, speaking of that shot. Michael Jordan's shot, 1989, of course, the first round of the Eastern Conference playoffs, and he was on the losing end of it. And Craig, unfortunately for you, the anniversary isn't as good as it is for Brad, but coming up on May 7th, a moment with which you will always be associated. How did that affect the rest of Elo's life? How do you feel? I feel great about it. I mean, I'll tell you the truth. At first, you know, it's it's a bad taste in your mouth. But uh, I think as iconic as it's gotten uh, for Michael Jordan and for his legacy, I'm included in it. So I'm not going to complain. That's a pretty good person to be associated with. And I've heard Michael talk about it. We were starting to become a winning franchise. I've heard Eggs talk about it before. How did you make that shot? <laughs> Um, I've heard Harp now talk about how he was supposed to guard <laughs> Michael. We'll get to that. I got MJ. Yeah, okay. Whatever. Fuck this bullshit. But what I wanted to do was I wanted to get the guy that threw the ball in and the guy that was guarding Michael, all of us together at the same time, to go through, uh, you know, what transpired from the huddle to the sideline, on the floor, and everything from both sides. So Brad Sellers with us from the Bulls uh, in 1989. Craig Elo with us from the Cavaliers, 1989, the shot, May 7th. The Bulls are going to play Cleveland in 89 in the best three of five. Most basketball observers believed Cleveland was better. Nobody has picked the Bulls. Everybody in the media, we picked Cavs. Everybody's picked nationally in the Cavs. Back then, we played teams six times in our division. They beat us six times, six and no. Off of lead. Six and no. So now in our mind, we got nothing to lose. Bulls win the first game, and then Cleveland wins the second in Cleveland. We go back to Chicago, Bulls win game three. Well, on game three on Saturday, uh, after he hit his 33rd point, uh, he was running down the court, and uh, I kind of came down along beside him, and, and he was he was saying, you can't guard me, you can't guard me, and I was just like, he's never said that before, so it kind of surprised me. Uh, I've always heard him talk, but never directly at me. Game four, Jordan's got a free throw at the end of regulation. Misses. Misses. The Cavaliers have kept their hopes alive. We go back to Cleveland for game five. And welcome to the Richfield Coliseum for game five between the Chicago Bulls and the Cleveland Cavaliers. Up to that time, the franchise, the history of the Bulls was blowing leads. And you're like, oh my God, this is going to happen again. They're going to do this. They're going to blow this. They're going to lose this series to Cleveland. So game's about to start, and there was two other beat writers. Beat writer from the Sun-Times, Lacey Banks, and Kent McDill from the Herald, and, and me. And Lacey's picked Cavs to sweep in three. Ken's picked the Cavs to win in four, and I picked the Cavs to win in five. Game's just about to start. And Michael walks over to Lacey, and he points to the We took care of you. And he looks at Kent, and he says, We took care of you. And he looks at me, and we take care of you today. We went back and forth the whole time. Jordan against Harper. Great turnaround. It was a very tough game. This is the playoffs, and here we have two great teams right here, guys that lay it out. It was a constant battle. The 
the last two minutes of that game was just it, insane. I mean, it was like, they yeah, scored, man. we scored, yeah. We have had drama here in the final minutes of the game. 11 seconds to go in the middle of the floor. Jordan has it. And Jordan puts up a jumper and hits with six seconds to go. Jordan hits the basket and now has 42 points in the game. And the Cavaliers have called a timeout. We get the ball with six seconds left. Craig is on the inbound. So Craig is probably the... We, we were not thinking Craig Elo, right? And so... Coach Wilkins draws up a great play. He's got two decoys and uh, Mark Price and uh, Ron Harper and Brad Doherty all on the offside. Uh, we're so much shredding the other way towards Mark and to Larry and trying to figure out what was going to happen. Obviously, Harp's there. And Coach Wilkins said, throw it high to Larry and then just cut hard to the basket. And they're going to try to think that we're going to Mark and we're not, we're going to go right back to you. And Craig gets the inbound pass to, to Larry. I'm checking Larry, so I'm ready for Larry to make a move. Larry Nance is at, on the post on the ball side, and I'm throwing it into him. We see Craig dark. We didn't catch that at the end, right? <laughs> and it was a simple give and go, and it worked to perfection. It's it into Nance, gets the ball back, drives to the hoop, and plays it in for three seconds to go. And by the time we even got it, reacted to it, he was to the hoop and laid it in, right? 21,000 in Richfield Coliseum, and the place erupts. As soon as he makes his layup, and I, I've, I've told just a few people there, you talk about walking to the bench, Kenny? What I say to myself, right? I don't know what anybody else says. I say we're screwed. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> we're screwed. It's only three seconds left on the clock here. He hit the what would have been the winning bucket with three seconds left to put Cleveland up 100 to 99. Uh, you know, after we scored, um, the Bulls called timeout, obviously, to advance the ball. When we went to the sideline after I scored and we're up by one, 100 to 99, we had the luxury of having a timeout left. Cleveland has one timeout left. So we were going to do what every team did, was let them go out and set up and see how they were. We're going to wait for Chicago to come out, set up, call our timeout. So that first timeout, we're not even discussing anything. We're just waiting for the 60 seconds to go away. And the timeout, Doug Collins, our coach, is like, OK, we're going to do X, Y, Z. Brad, you got the ball out. We have no timeout. Nothing. Right. We have nothing, right? And three seconds remain. Chicago, with a timeout, now has only a 20. That timeout that uh, the Bulls called, while Brad and them were discussing the play and who he was going to throw it into and everybody, we were just over there catching our breath because we knew that we were going to go back out and then we call a timeout and then come right back with a, with a timeout. You'll see the drama unfold. The big thing here is that you jam the passer or you, know, you put a lot of pressure on the man. Now, Nance is laying off him right now, but watch to see if he runs at the ball or he picks up the cutters coming to the ball. And we went out. Michael set up right at that free throw line, and I walked out straight to him, and I said, Mr. Jordan, I said, we're going to call a timeout, and I'm going to go back, and I'm going to say, to coach, this is what you told me. And I said, you're not going to score. <laughs> and he didn't even really say, but his eyes said a thousand things because, mm -hmm. you know, he had his hands on his shorts like this and he just kind of looked up at me mm -hmm. like that and yeah. rolled his eyes. We call timeout or we had a 20, so we go back over. The Cavaliers have used their last timeout after they checked Chicago's alignment. We knew they had a timeout to burn, so we figured they were going to get a quick look at it. And so we just dummied up the first time out, right? Here's our story here at Richfield Coliseum. One of these teams will advance. It has been a thrilling game. The Bulls have three seconds to try a shot and try to win the game. When we go to the huddle again for the second time out, it's really erratic in the, in the huddle, right? Obviously, everybody's got a lot to say. Doug is saying his bit. We, the, the fans are screaming loud, right? We're down to three seconds on the clock. In my mind, I'm thinking, 
it's only three. I got a, I got a five count to get it in, and there are only three seconds on the clock. And I'm thinking about how am I gonna get this ball around Larry? As we're walking out, this is what Michael tells me. In all this pandemonium, Michael says, "Brad, just stay with me. I'm gonna get free. I'm gonna get free." And so we went back out. Coach Wilkins decides to double Mike, which wasn't a bad play, right? It's three seconds on the clock. That at least gives me a look, right? I'm not bothered by long hands, long arms. I'm not. I'm not bothered by that at all. My only thing now is thinking: Can I get this ball to him? Because you go back and look at the tape, Craig. Did anybody else want that ball? <laughs> no, no. Everybody was on the far baseline. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Kitty. You know what I'm thinking? If I don't get this ball to him, I'm screwed. We drew a play where I was coming to the ball, but I only had time enough to get one dribble and get a jump shot off. But we're gonna live and die with that scenario. So I was doing everything I can to get the ball. Everybody knew where the ball was gonna go. Everybody in the building know where the ball is trying to go. We know exactly what they got. You know, they had Craig Elo on me at the time, which, you know, honestly was a mistake because the guy that played me better was Ron Harper. I said, coach, I got MJ. I got MJ. So the coach tells me, I'm gonna put Elo on MJ. And I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. Fuck this bullshit. I get the ball, Kenny is a five count. I'm going 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. I said, oh, 1,003. It's going <laughs> I'm looking around, I scan the crowd real quick. Nobody else wants, nobody else wants this thing. We get to 1,004, and he only gets free at the end. Craig slips a little bit. I tried to make it as hard as I could uh, of guys getting around me, but I would take the middle away most of the time because that's the most dangerous point. And he know. gets free because he shoved Larry and threw Larry off a little bit before Larry could recover. Yeah, Larry kind of went with the okie doke there. And then it, it left me chasing him out to the wing. As soon as he caught it on the wing, he was already coming back to the free throw line and my momentum was going the other way. So now I'm running to this way to catch him. And it gave him time to get down, get his dribble up and get his the launch shot that goes up. And I think, and I'm standing there, it seemed like eternity. Mm. It seemed like eternity. I just get my hand up, but he got, he stops on a dime and goes straight up. And if you watch, he kind of double clutched the shot. And uh, as soon as I went by, he let go and had a clean look at it. And the rest is history. And this shot goes through Kenny, and I just sprint across the floor. left his hand. Did you know it was, gonna, it was going in? Uh, it, it, not really. I mean, I, I when I was watching it, because I had to turn and, and look, uh, I mean, it looked flat, and I think, you know, he didn't have to rush, but uh, it, I just didn't think it was going to go in because it did hit some of the rim. So that's that was what I was thinking, but boy, when it did. Elo's on the floor, Jordan's in the Gatorade commercials, posters, everything else. Well, that's another one that Elo didn't, he played for another eight years in the NBA, but that became what he was known for. My signature moment with Gatorade and Nike and all of those is me going to the floor and Michael jumping up and down fist pumping. Uh, after he watched it go in. If you're gonna be associated with something like that, then who better to be associated with than, than Michael? I feel very vindicated from when we started the playoff. The dim look that everybody was giving us. Even I asked you in the locker room, I asked everybody, you know, what was the feeling back in Chicago? Did it, did it write us off yet? And, and you said some of them have written us off. I said, well, tell those guys to stay home. Somebody had written or said that the Bulls were gonna go home. Send them home. And so when he hits the shot, go home, motherfuckers, go home. Get the fuck out of here. Get Go fucking anywhere, but you out of here. Whoever's not with us, all you fuckers go to hell. And I got to tell you, the first guy over to Michael after he was doing all that fist pumping was number two. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, Craig, I couldn't get there fast enough. <laughs> I know, you there. Craig, Craig, it's the simple things in life. I get to go back to Chicago, and it's not going to be a problem. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jordan, beat him at the buzzer with a jump shot in the 
it was so dramatic, and it was typical what we'd see Michael do the rest of his career in big moments. Craig catches a lot of heat for it, which is undeserved, right? Let me tell you this, Craig. Listen, it wasn't like he didn't do that to everybody, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like he didn't do it to everybody. I mean, this is like, here, Craig, I was fortunate. This was a this was a weekly occurrence. What you saw in those games, Craig, that's how practice was every day. Yeah. He only knew one speed. Yeah. He only knew one speed, and it was full speed. That shot enabled the Bulls to start growing and believing that something special was on the horizon. If you know anything about the Doug Collins years in in uh, Chicago, they always his favorite thing was get the ball to Michael and get out of the way. I guess the shot was iconic because it kind of propelled uh, Chicago to that next level yeah. uh, uh, for them. And We finally got over the hump of losers mentality. We were starting to become a winning franchise. Now, I thought you weren't supposed to be feeling so well coming into today's game. <laughs> you know, a lot of people put a lot of pressure on me and uh, you know, I still couldn't concentrate and make my free throws. But I didn't have to take a free throw in the last shot. It was a shot. I felt comfortable. We came in. We stuck tough. We hung right in there. Gave ourselves a chance to win. And we won the ball game. I told Michael a thousand, maybe a million times, like, I took that away from you. How did you make that shot? <laughs> and, you know, this guy was the limit. That's the greatness of Michael Jordan. Great defense was beaten by great offense. And I, and I love the, the, just the celebration afterwards. Yes. But that yes. kind of was Michael's coming out. That's where everybody said, man, this guy, everybody knew he was special. The legend of Michael just kept growing from that point on and all the championships. And as we've all said, that's the reason he's the GOAT, to make shots like that.